Well, you have been praying along with me for the Knotts family. We've been praying for Jennifer and Mary Jane. Jennifer, as you know, is out of the hospital and off. As far as I know, all of the medications that they had, all of her values are down to what it normally was before she went into the hospital, before she, uh, at the end of her pregnancy. But uh, I wanted to show you, thanks to, to Toby who sent me the pictures, I want you to see that person you were praying for, Mary Jane. You just show her right now. Amen. So continue to pray for Mary Jane. Look at that. He's just beaming over there. What a proud daddy. Just keep praying for Mary Jane. Toby told me that she's basically off of most everything. That, I don't know. How do they feed her? She's fed by... Or two. Okay. So she's... Uh, eight weeks premature, is that correct? Eight, nine weeks? Eight weeks premature, nine weeks premature. Uh, but you saw her, she's doing great. Continue to pray for her because I'm sure the family wants to have her home. So pray for her, please. Continue to pray for her. One of the many attractions that we visited while our family was in London here was uh, a place called Westminster Abbey. As we went through the city, and especially when we went to attractions, um, little Jonathan, you probably know who I'm talking about, our son Jonathan, he's got really short legs. So he can't move really fast. So what we would do to save time is we would, I would say something like this to him. Okay, it's time for you to ride. And I'd put him up on my shoulders, and we'd go wherever we needed to go. And I'd just hang on to him, and he would ride. He liked it. It was heavy, but he liked it. While we were in the Abbey, we went in, paid our money. I put him up on my shoulders because I wanted to walk quickly. I didn't want to go searching for him among all these tombs, basically. And so... Put him up there. The lady at the front desk, after giving us the tickets, gave us brochures. She gave Jonathan a brochure. So you can imagine, here's my four-year-old son sitting up on my shoulder. He's trying to read the brochure. I have no idea if it's right side up, upside down, back. I don't know. All I know is that he's got his brochure up there. And as I'm walking through the abbey, he keeps doing one of these things. Hey, Jonathan, I can't see. Lift it up a little bit. So I push it up and push it up. And then pretty soon it's coming back down over my eyes. And put, finally, I said, Teresa, take it away from him, please. But it was a fascinating place. In 1045, Edward the Confessor laid the groundwork for what we know as Westminster Abbey. 20 years later, in 1065, it was consecrated. And since 1066, when William the Conqueror was coronated there, there have been a total of 38 coronations of royalty in England in this abbey. The last one was on June 3rd, 1953, with Queen Elizabeth II. Fascinating place, but it's also a place that not only has monuments, there are tombs literally all over the place. People where they're, they're buried, I'm assuming in these monstrous monuments, are coffins as well. And the thing I didn't like about the abbey is as we're walking around the abbey, you're walking around and, and it's concrete or stone floor, and you stop and you look down and you say, whoa, I'm standing on someone's grave. You see the name and when they were born, when they died, and they say, oh, and so you kind of step over here and you go, oh, I'm standing on someone else's grave. They're just all over the place on there. I mean, people like... Charles Darwin is buried there, which I don't get that one, but Isaac Newton is buried there. Many of the kings and some of the queens are interned there at Westminster Abbey. It's a fascinating place to visit, just fascinating. In 1864, a guy named Arthur Stanley took over as dean of Westminster Abbey. He took over from a guy named Richard Trench, who was a, a powerful evangelistic preacher, expository preacher, brought back preaching really to the abbey. In fact, it was this, this time that they had light, gas lighting in the abbey and they would have services at night and fill the entire abbey up with people listening to Trench preach the gospel message. Poor people weeping. I mean, poor people in the abbey, place of royalty. It's amazing. Well, when he was given the deanship, he said, I don't want to go to that church of tombs. That was his attitude. But as soon as he got there, there was something about the abbey that fascinated him. He just was so intrigued about all of the history and all of the treasures that were inside this abbey that he really then from that point on began a search for the treasures of the abbey. He would go at night with torches throughout the abbey looking for vaults that had been sealed over. Maybe there were tombs or monuments behind there. In fact, he took one guy named uh, J.R. Fraud, who was a historian. He went with him on one night, and this is what he commented about Arthur Stanley. He said this, It was the weirdest scheme, the flaming torches, the banners waving from the drought of air, perhaps even some of these banners that you see up there. It's part of the abbey there. And the dean's keen, eager face, seen in profile, had the very strangest effect. 
He asked me to return with him the next night. My nerves had had, had quite enough. Stanley became consumed with the quest for treasures inside the abbey. As a matter of fact, Queen Victoria called him that body snatcher. I don't think he actually took any bodies, but apparently he would open up coffins to make sure that their people were really in there. He'd find bones that were missing that people had stolen hundreds of years ago. He did everything within his power to make sure that the historical treasures of the abbey were restored. He was passionately searching for the treasures, treasures inside this place that's known as Westminster Abbey. I don't know if you've thought about it before. Every one of us sitting here today, without exception, we are on a quest for treasures. Did you ever think of that about before? Without exception, whether you're young, teenager, older than I am, retired, makes no difference. We are on a quest for treasure. Our life really is about seeking after treasures. Now, we're going to see in the text today that there are obviously are treasures that you and I want to seek after, and there are treasures that really are a waste of our time. We do understand that, but the bottom line is you and I are seeking for treasures this morning. As we open up to Matthew chapter 6, and starting in verse number 19, Jesus is going to talk about this very thing, the quest for treasures, seeking after treasures in our life. He's going to address it. Remember, we talked about in chapter 5, he was dealing with the inner character qualities, that, that person who is a follower of Jesus, one who has been born again into the family of God, that inner character quality. Chapter 6 started, we saw last week, verses 1 through 18, was how we live out that holy life that has been given to us in Christ, how these inner characteristics influence our behavior and our attitudes of everyday living, living in this world. And that's what Jesus is going to talk about today. As we're living in this world, and you and I all are in this world, not one of us went to heaven immediately after we became saved. Now you say, duh, you're all sitting right here. I understand that. If you went right to heaven after you got saved, you wouldn't be sitting here today. So we know that we're in this world still. How do we interact in this world? How do we go through our life as a believer in this world? What are real treasures, permanent ones? Let's read verses 19 through 21 and look at here the true treasures Jesus is talking about. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's laying down a principle now for us to live. And he's going to give us a couple illustrations of those principles. But here's the principle that he wants to talk about. He says there are two types of treasures in this world. There are earthly treasures or worldly treasures, and there are heavenly treasures, those things that are in the heavens. And he gives us a comparison here about these treasures. He can talk a little bit about these. Now, when he says earthly, he doesn't mean planet Earth. That's not what he's talking about. When he's talking about worldly treasures, he's not talking about planet Earth treasures. Now, obviously, our treasures are on this Earth. I understand that. But when he's talking about world, he's talking about a world view, a way of viewing life, a way of attributing value to something. So earthly treasures have attributed values to certain items that the earth, the world, considers to be valuable. In contrast to heavenly treasures, where God places a value on certain things. You see the contrast that Jesus is talking about right here. He wants to give us help here as we're living in this world as believers that we don't fall in love with this world. It's a great danger that you and I have, especially flashy 21st century America. All of the advertisement and the commercials and the, the billboards and the magazines are all glitzy trying to get us to buy into a certain system, a way of thinking, a way of looking at life. So he wants to say, listen, I want to help you not fall in love with the world. I'm going to give you some, some principles this principle of laying up treasures in heaven instead of on the earth, is, it has a, it's twofold. It's, it's a negative and a positive. Sometimes we think of, of treasure simply as, as wealth, money. Well, that's part of it, but that's not all of it. So when I say treasures, I'm not talking about just about money. In fact, to the Oriental or the Hebrew mind, not only was wealth, money, something, but clothing was also extremely important. Land was important. Houses were important. So it's not just money. And so I don't want to get trapped into this mindset of when we talk about treasures, it's just money. It's not. It's all of those things that you and I place a value on. Those are treasures. All of those things we may lock up, we may not lock up. 
And it may even be an item that doesn't have in the world standard a value such as a sentimental, sentimental piece of jewelry that has a great treasure for us. It's anything that we place a value on is our treasure. And Jesus wants us to know right up front, listen, you got to have the right view of life. you got to make sure you're viewing life correctly. You see the contrast of earthly and you see the contrast of heavenly. I want to make sure that you're viewing life correctly, Jesus is wanting to say us to tell us. Because if we view this world and the things in this world as something that's all about me or all about my pleasures, then we're going to run into a problem like a, a guy in one of Jesus' parables. This guy was a farmer. I mean, and he did a great job farming. I guess he put the right fertilizer down, gave the right amount of water. God watered it. God gave the sunshine. We already talked about that before. Nevertheless, these crops grew up, and they were so bountiful that he says, I don't have a place to put all this stuff. I have got so much crops. I can't do anything with it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger ones so I can house all of my crops. See, he never thought about his neighbor who was in need, perhaps, that needed food. It was all about him and his crops. So he builds big towers. Now, if we view life that it's all about me or all about my pleasures, we're going to start thinking just like this guy. Everything will revolve around me. But in the contrast to that, when Jesus gives the application to the parable that he gives in Luke chapter 12, in fact, he says this about the guy, but God said to him, fool, don't look at life that way. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Amassing all kinds of things, the guy dies at night, who gets it? One of his heirs. He doesn't get to keep it. He can't take it with him. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If we're not careful, if we have a view of life that everything's about me and my pleasures, we're going to start thinking just like this guy. Ooh, I heap it upon myself. In contrast to that, Jesus gives an application later on in Luke 12. He says, if we view life as one that's all about loving God and all about loving our neighbor as ourselves, all about serving other people and serving God, when it doesn't rotate around me, when we start viewing life like that, then I'm going to use those things I have, my wealth, to bless others. That's a whole different lifestyle, a whole different way of looking at life. As a matter of fact, Jesus in application says this, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Sounds very similar to what Matthew said in this place in Matthew chapter 6. We have to have a correct view of the way we look at life. We can't buy into what the world system says. This is valuable, glitzy, shiny, so special. Another thing we have to realize is this. Those things that we treasure... Think about it, honestly. We're not permanent holders of these things. We have them for a short time. They may even be our children that we value. We have them for a short time. We are simply stewards of things that have been given to us, that someday give an account for those things that have been given to us. We don't have them permanently, these treasures. Here we see clearly why we're not going to why we have to lay up treasures in heaven, why we don't want to lay them on earth, because these worldly treasures, these, these values, these treasures that the world says, this is important, they're only transient and they're temporary. They, they don't last. They don't stand the test of time. I wish I could buy a car, and in five years down the road, that it looked exactly the same as the day I drove it off the lot. I wish I could own a house. I could buy a house and in 10 years not have to do a thing to the house. All the men says? Amen. Amen. Wouldn't it be great? No repairs. No gutter that falls off or shingles that get ripped off by the wind. No screens that break out, that fall out. Wouldn't it be great if the houses we owned or the cars we owned would stay in this pristine condition that we actually bought them in? Wouldn't that? But we know that's not true. Worldly treasures, they're temporary. They're transient. They don't pass the test of time. Moth come and eat our clothing up. Or rust comes. Anything that's corrosive. It doesn't have to be just rust as we know rust, but anything that corrodes any kind of a valuable item. Or where thieves break in and steal. And that's the idea. The Greeks actually called a burglar a mud digger or a wall digger. And the reason why is the, the walls were made out of mud with little bits of brick in it or, or sticks perhaps, so they would dig through the wall. So the Greeks called a burglar a mud digger or a wall digger. 
And I hope that has never happened to you, that you come home one time and your house has been ransacked and stuff stolen out of it. But it happens. Worldly treasures are transient. They're temporary. Now, spiritually speaking, worldly treasures, we have to understand, will never, ever satisfy us. They'll never satisfy us. Remember that thing that you wanted to buy? You wanted to buy it so badly. The desire, the craving, the, the passion was there, so you saved your money. And you saved your money, and you saved your money, and pretty soon you had enough money to go buy it, and you went out and bought it, and you were so happy the day that you bought it home. You were just floating on cloud nine. Two to six months later, your whole attitude has changed toward it. It's not important anymore. Perhaps you've even forgotten about it. Think about your children and all those game systems they have at home. So excited when they first come home, a year later they don't even play them anymore. We're the same way as adults. We're the same way as adults. They never will fulfill us. They always leave us unsatisfied. The wise man Solomon said, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. You just won't be satisfied with it. Nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is vanity. J.D. Rockefeller, who was probably the first billionaire, actually he made $900 million. Now, I think I could live with that. How about you? $900 million. He wasn't quite a billionaire. But the first man who became a quasi-billionaire. He was asked one time, how much money? Now, you remember, $900 million. Not quite Bill Gates, but $900 million. How much money makes a person happy? His answer was this, just a little more. $900 million, and just a little more? My word, I, I wouldn't even know what to, I would run out of things to buy after a time with $900 million, and just a little more, why? Because money will never satisfy. Earthly treasures will never fill that void that we have of real meaning and value in life. They never will. But those treasures in heaven, in contrast to the treasures on the earth, those heavenly treasures that have heavenly values, those are those rewards that we saw in verses 1 through 18. When we give, when we pray, when we fast, and we could expand that to when we serve, when we drive someone to an appointment that, that needs it, when we go over to their house to help them paint it, when we fill in the blank. All of those items that Jesus talked about, when we do those things not to be seen of men, we were told in the text that God rewards us for that. These heavenly treasures are those kind of rewards that God gives. They're in His presence. He has them to give to us. And the day we stand before Him, He'll evaluate our works and He'll say, here you go. Great job, you faithful servant. Here it is. Good job. And I like what we see here, because those, those ones up in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. These treasures are secure with God. Now, I don't know if you're big enough to take something from God. I'm not. And I'm happy to know that he's going to guard these treasures in heaven. I think that's fantastic. We were in the Tower of London, which is one of the first one of the first big castles built in England. And as we were walking around the armory of the Tower of London, in the midst of the armory was this column from top to bottom. And on the column, it was a spiral column that went down like this. And on the column, all the way around the spire, were pistols, flint-loaded, muzzle-loading pistols, all the way around the column. And on the end of each one of the pistol handle grips was metal. So Taylor's standing next to me, and I said, hey, I said, look at the pistols. He said, oh, these are cool. I said, do you know what that metal is on the end of the pistol grip, the handle of the pistol? He said, no, what is it? I said, well, when you shoot your shot, you don't have time perhaps to reload and you need a weapon, you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you just flip the pistol over and you use the metal end as a weapon. He says, whoa, cool. So I says, now look at it right there. And I got about six inches from the pistol. And I hear this, woo, 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 woo. And I went, whoa. This guy comes running, not running, walking fast towards me. And I assured him, I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it. And I'm thinking, where are the sensors for this thing? I look in the ceiling, there are no lines. You know, you think light lines going down and you get too close and the sensor sets it off. There are no sensors anywhere. I have no idea where the sensors were. But if they're going to guard these pistols in the Tower of London so well as that, don't you think God can guard our treasures we leave up there with him? Don't you think so? And I'm happy that he's going to guard them much better than that, even in the Tower of London. This simply is an appeal to common sense. We know it. Those things of this earth, moth will destroy, or rust will destroy, or thieves will come and steal it. They're temporary, they're transient. That's common sense. We understand that. The danger we have is when we place our value on the earthly treasures and not the heavenly treasures, we'll find out that these treasures will exert a power over us. 
They will begin to control us. They will begin making decisions for us. That's the danger that we see here. They will affect our whole man, our mind, our will, our emotions. Now, I need to say perhaps right here, hear me, there is nothing wrong with wealth. Being rich is not evil. It is not wrong. As a matter of fact, it is a gift of God. If you have the ability to make money and keep it, you're blessed. There's no, that's great. There's nothing wrong with wealth. I don't want you to give the impression if you have money, it's bad. It is not bad. There's nothing wrong with wealth. As a matter of fact, again, the wise man said, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. There is nothing wrong with wealth. The question is, what do we do with what God has given to us? If I take my wealth and heap it upon myself for me and my pleasures, that's wrong. Or if I use my wealth to bless others, that is right. There's nothing wrong with wealth. It's how we use wealth. As a matter of fact, we're not even supposed to love money. That's the root of all kinds of evil, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy. So wealth is not wrong. It's how in our action and our attitude towards wealth that can become right or wrong that we have to evaluate. Look at verses 22 and 23. He's going to give us an idea about how this principle of laying up treasures in heaven instead of on earth plays out in the, in the parable of the idea of an eye. Let me read it to you. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And you're going, what? What is that? Really simple. Let's stay on the physical level first. We know that if the eye is clear, if it is healthy, if there are no cataracts or anything floating over the eye, the light from the outside will come through the eye and into us. That's how it enters into us, light. How we perceive things comes in through the eye, if it is clear and if it's healthy. On the other side, physically speaking now, if our eye has cataracts, or a film over it, or if there's something wrong, or if we're blind, light cannot enter in through that eye. That's on the physical level. Now he's going to take it next to the spiritual level. He's going to say this, that the single eye is the one that has the clear vision, clearly sees what the true heavenly treasures are, values those things that God values, puts off the earthly treasures because he realizes worldly values are not equal to God's values. He sees clearly on the spiritual side. No lens, no filter. The evil eye, on the other side, the bad eye, the one that can't let light in, is the one that sees the world through a filter. And normally that filter that the evil eye sees the world through is me. How does it affect me? What is it my pleasure involved here? The evil eye normally looks through the filter of ego. When our spiritual sight, that is, how we view the world, is directed towards heavenly treasures, we will have a healthy view in this life. We will go through this life as believers viewing the true riches of heaven and seeing them instead of getting sidetracked by the glitz and glamour of the treasures and values of this world. But when our eye is evil, our view of this world becomes very deceptive. We don't see clearly. You ever talk to somebody after six months, it seems like their whole value system had shifted somehow? We don't know how, but it did. It shifted. They see things differently. And when the eye becomes evil, we easily mistake the true value of what an object is. We don't place the right value on it. I like this guy. His name is uh, W. Robertson Nicole. And the classical work they wrote is called the Expositor's Greek Testament. Trust me, I'm not going to speak Greek to you. Simply, he paraphrased it, and I thought he did such a great job paraphrasing this passage. Let me read it to you. The eye is the lamp of the body. When it is healthy, we see to do our daily work. When diseased, we are in darkness. So with the eye of the soul, the heart, the seed of desire, when it is free from covetousness, not anxious to hoard, all goes well with our spiritual functions. We choose and act wisely. When sordid passions possess it, there is darkness within deeper than that which afflicts the blind man. We mistake the relative value of things, choose the worse, neglect the better, or flatter ourselves that we can have both. And that's what Jesus now wants to move into, this idea of thinking we can have both. The treasures of this world and the treasures that are in heaven. Look at verse number 24. 
No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. That word is mammon. It's an Aramaic word for wealth, riches. So money is a good translation here. See, there are two masters in this verse. There is God and there is money. And they are two distinct masters of op opposite character and interest. That's the word other. It's not other of the same kind. It's other of a different kind. They're contrasts. God and riches. But they are two masters. And both of these masters demand complete allegiance. Either riches or God. Because they're masters. You cannot serve God and money. They each one make a totalitarian, a complete allegiance pledge to the one who is underneath them. God claims total lordship over all that belongs to him. He is God. He is Lord. Back in Bible college, we had a fun day back in 1985. It was called Rent-A-Friend Day. And in Rent-A-Friend Day, we were trying to raise money as a mission prayer band to go on a mission trip to Mexico. So we would sell people. I know that sounds bad, so that's why we called it Rent-A-Friend Day. We rented a friend from 6.30 in the morning till 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Guess who bought me? Very good. She bought me. Five bucks. Boy, I was... There's a value for you. This is what it looked like. Yeah. <laughs> That's really me. On that day from 6.30 to 1 p.m., she could do anything she wanted to me as long as within the guidelines of the Bible college. You understand, okay? Anything she wanted to do with me because she bought me. I was her slave. Yeah, okay. Servant. She did that to me. That is me. And on top of this, it happened to be the day of chapel. And in chapel that day, they were awarding the best dorm room of the month. Guess who won? <laughs> I had to go in front of the entire student body dressed like that to accept my certificate of award. She controlled me that day. She was my master. Yeah, yeah, right. Only day since. Now nah, that's not true. Think about it now. To have God as my master, to have God as my Lord, I can be assured that he will never use me or abuse me. That's against his character. To have God as my Lord and my master, I can be assured that he always wants my best. Even though I may not understand the direction he's sending this servant on that day, I know it's the best for me because I know God's character. Why is it so difficult for us to place ourselves under the lordship of Christ? Why do we have such a hard time doing that? I know why I have a hard time doing that. You know why? Because I want to be in control. I want to make all the decisions. I know why I have a hard time doing that. But why as Christians, when we know God will never use us, we know God will never abuse us, we know God always wants the best for us, he's wholly good in all of his actions, why then do we hesitate placing ourselves under the lordship of Christ? Why? We know it intellectually, but we have a hard time doing it practically in day-to-day -day living. You cannot serve God and riches at the same time. You cannot serve God and money. Each one makes a total claim on our life. And every time that I choose, because I want to be in control, every time I choose to disobey Christ, who is my master or my Lord, I sin against his lordship in my life. He is so patient with me, though, and I'm glad. He's so full of grace and mercy to forgive me. But every time I say, no, it's my way, God, not your way, what I'm doing is I'm disobeying his leadership in my life. Jesus said you can't sit on the fence is basically what he's saying. Either you love God and serve him or you love riches and serve them. You can't do both. You can't have both. It doesn't work that way. You can't love the world and love God at the same time. That doesn't happen. And we have to make sure that that view of the world that we have, that it's a right view, it's a clear eye that's looking correctly at the true values of heaven and all the things around us. Because if we have a materialistic worldview, it will control us. Do you notice what it says right there? You cannot serve God and money. A materialistic worldview will control us. It will exert a power upon us. It'll do something like this. Riches, God. God says do this. Riches says that's not practical. That's not realistic. 
So we have at this point a choice. Do I let riches exert control over my life or do I let God exert control over my life? If I live materialistically, if I let the material things of this world control my life, I am in essence without God. I'm godless at that moment. I can't be faithful to God and to make an idol of wealth. Jesus said that's impossible. You can't sit on the fence. You either serve God and love him or you serve riches and love them. There is no in between. Because it's two contrasting worldviews, way of living life. To seek the permanent treasures, we must now focus our attention heavenward, to the, to the values that are in heaven, and to look there. See, like I said, in the 21st century, we have people that pay millions of dollars for 30 seconds of advertising time on television. Why? They want to convince you that their product is exactly what you need to fulfill your life, and they spend millions of dollars doing it. Millions of dollars for 30 seconds. And it's glitzy. It's glamorous. It catches our attention. And some of us even start to go, ooh, hmm, I wonder. I wonder, is that right? If I have a Jaguar, really? Will, will, will people like me better? Well, no. But we start believing it. We have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't focus our attention on the, the worldly values around us, things contained just in this world, but that we seek those treasures that are in heaven. Paul says it like this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Don't focus on the values of this earth. Focus on the values that are in heaven, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, think about, on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. It's a new way of looking at life. It's a focus on the eternal values, not the worldly temporary values. It's focusing, focusing, focusing. When we were in Covent Garden uh, at the marketplace there, there was a tightrope walker, and he was tied up between two columns. He was jabbing and jabbing and jabbing for a long time, and it almost got boring, but he was trying to get people together, and there was a bunch of crowd watching him. He was promising us something spectacular. He was going to juggle while he was walking on backwards on a tightrope. That's pretty impressive. I couldn't do it. So he's jabbering, 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 jabbering. The whole time he's leaning against the pillar and the ropes in front of him. Just when he started to go on his walk, he stopped talking. You could see his eyes. I mean, I was standing at this. I was standing right here. He was right here. And the other, other pillar was right here. So I was watching him. I watched his eyes. His eyes focused immediately in front of him, right straight on that pillar. Not left, not right. He didn't listen to anything what I had to say because he was focused on keeping his balance as he walked on this rope. I couldn't do that. That was amazing. Focused. Focused. And he started walking backwards, and he was juggling. He wasn't even watching what he was juggling. He'd done it so many times, he just knew where they were going to fall. But he was focused. And Paul says, we need to focus on that which is above. Don't be so focused on earthly treasures, earthly values, but focus on above things. The story is told of a sailor who got shipwrecked. Shipwrecked on, a, on an island that was, was inhabited. It was not, not inhabited. Anyway, you get the picture. It was inhabited. The islanders had a funny practice that they did. They would choose a man and make him king for a year. So they took this shipwrecked sailor that came off in, out of the ocean into the, onto the island, and they took him and they made him king for a year. And he's thinking to himself, whoa, awesome. I mean, I'm king. I was nobody in my homeland. Now I'm a king on this island. About three months into his kingship, king for a year, he started wondering, hmm, where are all the other kings at? So he asked. He said, where are all the other kings? He said, listen, we make people king for a year. After you're done being king for a year, we take you to this island. We drop you off on the island. You are banished there in exile. There is no escape from the island, and they all die on the island. And automatically, being king for a year didn't sound like a good idea to him. But then he got a bright idea. He said, wait, I'm king for a year. That means they do what I tell them to do. So he got together a bunch of farmers on boats, sent them over to the island, and began cultivating fields and planting crops. He took masons and carpentry people and sent them over to the island and began building houses and storage houses. And then he sent people over with storage provisions that would last and placed them in the storage houses on this island, thinking to himself, when my one year is up and I'm banished on the island, I'm not going to die. I'll have provisions to live on. So he did that his entire term. 
until his one-year kingship was over with. They took him, banished him to the island where everything was already prepared for him, stored up, waiting for him when he got there. That's a good parable of life. See, we're all stewards here. Stewards for a short time. I mean, and it really goes fast. Just ask Fritz and Bernil, who've been married 71 years. If you talk to them, they would probably say, it just seems like yesterday that we were holding hands talking about getting married. Time goes so fast. There's a song on the radio that reminds me of Fritz and Bernil every time I hear it. Walking her home. Starts off with they're walking home from a date and he realizes this 18-year-old girl is the one he loves and wants to spend the rest of his life with. So he's talking about falling in love with her as he's walking her home. The next segment of the song jumps into the birth of their first son. So he's standing at her bedside at the birth of her first son, remembering that day that he was walking her home when he realized the first time that he loved her. The song then jumps to the end where the wife is sick. The doctors don't think she's going to make it through the night, and the nurses say, should we bring him in? When they went to find him, he was already in the bedroom, sitting next to his wife, holding on to her hand, because he's going to walk her home. Life is so short. It's so short. It goes so fast. And if we focus on earthly things that are temporary and won't last, they'll have no value for us when we get to heaven. But if we prepare and we send ahead in the presence of the Father that are guarded by Him, when we exit this life, this earthly life, and go into His presence, they'll be waiting for us. Jesus said, that's what life's all about. Those are the values to put into your life. That's how you're supposed to look at life. I love this story. Worship team, would you please come up now to continue on with our service? Question now for us this morning is this. Are we sending it on ahead? Are we sending it on ahead? Is our view so clear that we see the true reality of life and the true values of heavenly treasures that we're sending on ahead those things that will be kept for us in the presence of the Father? Or... Are we consuming them today on ourselves? Where are we with a kingdom kind of heart? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the message of Jesus. It is a challenge for us this morning. It is a challenge because we are children of our time. Internet, cable, satellite, magazines, all of these things geared to promote earthly, worldly values. Father, they, are, they bombard us daily, and it is so difficult to stand up and say, wait, this is not right. And I pray for us this morning that we would have that clear eye, that single view, that dedication to you, devotion to you, for whatever I value, I devote myself to. And I want to pray for us this morning that we would look clearly at heavenly treasures and begin laying up those there in your presence. For we know these, these earthly ones are just temporary. So I pray that you would help us because we need it. We need your strength. We need to be reminded daily that we've lost focus, that we need to adjust ourselves again. Help us daily to keep on track and to stay focused. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.